If you recall, back, clear away the fog. If you were in Japan, you would stand up and down and do a little bit of gymnastics. Um, <clears throat> I could say something shocking, but I won't do that either. Now, I'll just remind you where we were. Um, and that is, uh, let's see, we were talking about the positive function of um, shame. It's function to not only defend, but even more to open a person towards love. It's not a flight from love, but an opening towards it. And then I said, I made, began to make two more points. The first one was that all of this is done in the context of sexual values. So there's no running away from it. And I mentioned this as one of several places in Love and Responsibility where Wojtyla uh, reveals this kind of, um, you could say the opposite of prudishness that I think maybe some people would expect in him, uh, for instance, that, that sexual values he sometimes speaks about when he talks about covering the body. I think it must be in this same section. He says that covering, but not so so much of a cover that it cannot be that these sexual values cannot become the origin of love, right? So there's a definite role, positive role, of sexuality that is recognized in various places, and this I think is one of them. The second point I wanted to make about shame that he makes, uh, is that it is not just a theoretical point. It comes immediately after the passage we read at the end of last, uh, the last section, 179. It is a, shame makes a point, he says, in a live and concrete fashion. So that, I think, is a very important thing to realize about shame. It's one of the benefits of it, uh, that it, 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 it makes it known in a palpable way in a way that is much harder uh, uh, to ignore than a mere theoretical point might be. Right? So there is a kind of practical force with which shame operates, if it is developed. Of course, it can also disappear, if you all know. But if it's a developed form of shame, it, it has a practical force a, 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 that a mere intellectual cognition doesn't have. So I may know... Uh, very well, the whole philosophy about the dignity of the person, and yet, if I have no sense of shame, uh, let it be violated without being fully aware of it. What the sense of shame does is give flesh and force, uh, subjective strength, you could say, to that um, knowledge of the value of the person. It translates knowledge into practice, uh, you could say. Yeah, does that, does that make some sense? So, so I think that is only mentioned briefly, but it seems to me an important thing to notice about shame. All right, I want to make, that, uh, I'm skipping a few points here to leave more room for discussion, but um, there is an important section we need to say a few things about, and that is called the absorption of shame by love. Uh, did you notice that uh, that part in the um, in the section, mm -hmm. the absorption of shame by love? What does that mean? Two kinds of shame, right and wrong, two kinds of 
absorption of shame. One is positive and the other one not so. So, so, so the idea is, uh, if you didn't hear him fully, is, is this idea that because shame is a response or a reaction to the threat of being used, uh, when there is a, a relation between two persons where there is love, where love is fully present and fully mature and fully developed, uh, then this shame uh, doesn't make itself felt. Right? So that, that, it seems to me, is, the, is what he means by the absorption of shame. So if uh, two people find themselves married, or rather <laughs> deliberately got married, um, <laughs> yeah. There are dreams where I find myself married, and not only that, but married with someone who's not my wife. And, and so, so I don't know. Yeah, forget it. <laughs> It'll be one question on my course. Ask me about all the people I am married to. <laughs> In my nightmares. Um, uh, all right, none of this is in the notes. Uh, where was I? Oh yeah. So so uh, so that's why there's no need for shame, right? If there's love, if there's genuine commitment to to the value of the other person, there has been this. Uh, willed mutual consent of a gift to self, then uh, the shame gets absorbed. Now, why does he say absorbed rather than eliminated? Because the shame should still exist at the other, outside of that couple, I guess. Uh, it, yes, but not only outside, also within, in a sense, I think. I didn't hear that. Yes, but now the love is fully present. So why shouldn't shame be eliminated? Yes. Possibly because the shame is an awareness that there is something there to protect and something to hide from others besides your spouse. And um, and now in that love, you don't need to hide it or protect it in the same way that you would. And, and there are some aspects of that love that still ought to be protected, you know. And yeah. Uh, maybe all that's that's also involved. In it. At least my understanding hasn't yet come. To the uh, well, on page 182, it says that um, absorption means only that love fully utilizes for its own purposes the characteristic effects of shame, uh, specifically that awareness of the proper relationship between the value of the person and sexual values. So in love, um, there's still this fundamental um, unity or um, revelation of the value of the person in sexual values. And so um, there's something of shame that's still carried through yeah. in love. Yeah, that's, that's more or less what I think to this, this idea that, that shame actualizes itself mm-hmm. when when the threat of use is being felt, when, 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 when love is breaking down in one place or another. And so uh, if you eliminate shame, then you eliminate, as it were, that, that warning, that emotional warning, something is wrong. So I think what this means is that shame is absorbed. That means I don't feel ashamed. I don't, there, no warning signals are going off because I'm adequately and fully loved by this other person and, and, and she by me and so on. So, so shame doesn't, I don't experience it. Yet as soon as um, something goes wrong, then the shame manifests itself again. So that shows that as kind of principles, as, a, as an awareness, as a standard, it was there all along. And as a standard, since it is crucial to the dignity of the person and to right relations between the sexes, it is, of course, extremely important. So that's what, that's what he wants to make sure we understand. The absorption of shame does not mean eliminating the standards that shame is there to protect. Now, one reason I think that is, that's important is, is uh, perhaps I think there is sometimes in uh, circles that, that uh, I travel in this idea that uh, 
sexual morality basically consists in saving sex for marriage. And while that is an essential part of sexual morality, it's by no means all of it or the deepest aspect of it. The deepest aspect of it, which explains why sex must be saved for marriage, is that sex is there to express adequately and affirm and, and embody the love for another person. Embodying the love sexually is not possible in, uh, outside of marriage. Then it inevitably, in one way or another, becomes a using of the person. Right? And, and Wojtyla makes that clear in several ways throughout the book. But even in marriage, it's not as if once you're married, you're, you're, you're free and clear. The, the, the love has been accomplished and sex is always an, 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 uh, and necessarily an embodiment of that love. Now, in marriage, too, things can go awry. The spouses can slowly but surely, maybe habitually, I don't know why, um, begin to approach one another with less uh, respect and love and affirmation, and it becomes a kind of using. So there, too, shame then rightly manifests itself um, in marriage. So also in marriage, in other words, that, that, that standard of love, of affirming one another, uh, is, uh, is extremely important in some ways. It's even more important in marriage, of course, than outside of marriage. So that's the, that's the point I wanted to, uh, or at least one of the points I wanted to bring across, uh, the difference between absorption of shame so that one doesn't feel constantly ashamed. In Holland, I've, we've been... Forget that. Um, now, there's another point I wanted to make, and this is the one you brought up earlier, that you also have something called a false absorption of shame. I think that's what he calls it, but I forget at the moment. There is a way in which shame because it's an emotion, perhaps, mainly because it's an emotion, can give way without the love being fully present. So there, it, what there would be in this case is a kind of sympathy between persons. I feel very close to them, as you said, uh, and I feel loved by that person, I feel understood by that person, and so on. And so slowly but surely, uh, that feeling becomes so strong that the feeling of shame, the, the, the of... of uh, the threat of being used by one another is um, goes away. But what Pratio wants to say that objectively speaking, it might still be there. And as a matter of fact, it, it is always there if you speak about the, the, the marital act or the conjugal act, unless uh, there is there is an objective marriage, right? So, so the the um, the thing he wants to warn against is that the mere absence of shame not, doesn't necessarily mean that shame has been truly absorbed. Uh, it could simply be that shame has given way in a negative sense, just like you may be doing things wrong and your conscience no longer warns you. Uh, it, uh, so, and, and that, that is something we have to uh, work against, and this is why, as he puts it um, in one page or another, uh, that, that it's very important to develop and strengthen the sense of shame. This is part of the of the task of education uh, that we develop, uh, excuse me, page one in page 186, right? This, this importance of the development of shame. And why? Because it is a true and strong sense of shame. That's the only uh, sure protection. That's the, it's, it's that kind of shame that will insist on true love on true committed love. A weakly developed shame or a misshapen shame might mistake for love what's really not love at all, might uh, give way before uh, the, the, the objective demands of true love have been met. That really... Uh, there's a whole other section, the last one in the, uh, in the chapter, which deals with shamelessness. And there the main uh, focus of the discussion is, uh, I think, has to do with, with practical consideration, the relation between uh, modesty uh, or shame and dress, um, which I think there's a lot of room for discussion. And he also talks there about uh, pornography, 
or sexuality in art. Uh, and but that I thought, if if you like, we can we can just discuss um, freely. So so if you read it, is there any? What is? Maybe I should open it uh, this way. What is um, pornography according to um, Vortiwa, and how is it um, related to everything we've been saying? And now you should feel free to direct your questions also to Maria and uh, John. Yes. Well, it seems that for him, pornography would be that you're promoting the sexual values as the real values of the person. The same thing in one sense, you could say you're, you're objectifying the person and also promoting the body as the true kind of value of the person. So you're kind of getting rid of the, the spirit or the love element. You're just focusing on, on that part of it. Yes. Yes. Um, what, what does, what does it, uh, how is it different from the tasteful art, say? Or, remember that? Maybe too obvious to uh, to even stick out in your memory, but he he makes the point that it's it's one thing for an artist to to make a mistake, to accidentally go too far and show more maybe than was necessary, uh, and and another thing to make the deliberate effort to have the definite intention to appeal to this uh, utilitarian mentality in men and women apparently. Uh, so, so, so it's a kind of deliberate attempt to destroy love and replace it with mere lust, which is uh, commercially much more uh, attractive. So that I think, uh, and, and in one, I don't know where I read this, perhaps in which he went himself, this definition of pornography, and, or at least the way of expressing it, it's often said that pornography shows too much, but the truth is that it doesn't show enough. Mm. Did, did that come from Wojtyla or did it? Okay. Certainly does not come from me. Uh, I just don't know what to put in the footnote. my term and it may not be very good. What, what were you missing at? Uh, well, just when I hear the word distasteful, I think it's negative. But I, I, what I got out of it was he was comparing pornography to actual like, good art that portrays the naked body or yeah. a romantic scene or something, but not in a, it's, you know, an explicit yeah. way, but in a, in a yeah. show the humanness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm very glad you say that because that, that, that that is what I meant. It's not. Let's say there. Are, it seems like there are three categories. One is genuine art in which the body, including in its full sexual, with all its sexual values, and therefore often naked and so on, is fully portrayed, and where the full human truth uh, uh, it comes across, even if it is the truth about the body, right? Um, so that would be that would be a successful and hopefully beautiful work of art, but also morally entirely in order. Then you have the, what I meant by distasteful is someone who maybe tries to do that and what instead comes out is the truth of the person is somehow obscured. And so what you see is a kind of, you don't see the person, you, you just see the body and it's, it's, it's at best distracting. And uh, So that would be the kind of art which maybe attempts to portray the truth of the person but uh, that makes a mistake. It's an, it's an erroneous, it's a mistaken, it's a flawed attempt, but, but well-attentioned. And then the third one is pornography, where this is not simply a mistake, but a deliberately sought effect in the art. And uh, I, I just find all of those distinctions helpful, and, and, and I'm glad you bring up this one, that he, that he fully realizes this, the necessity, even, of art to portray uh, fully in all its beauty and power, the also the sexual sphere uh, and the body. So I, I didn't mean to say anything against that. Distasteful is definitely a bad, bad expression. I have sort of a moral question that I had discussed with some Catholic artists, where it's um, within the study of art, especially in the classical tradition, uh, the, the nude model that you're working from. So perhaps from the artist's perspective, would perceive them and their dignity as a person, 
but it seems like there's it wouldn't really ever be wrong to be the, the model because you can't really control how it's being perceived and that it could be used for you know pornographic you know take on things rather than a, a dignified take. So in that sense, wouldn't it then make the artist as well culpable by um, allowing for a situation where there would have to be that model making I have lots of thoughts on that, but maybe, uh, maybe does anyone else have any thoughts on it? So you mean to say that this position that you're you're not holding, but you, somebody was arguing the position that uh, to be the model for one thing would always be morally wrong. To be a nude model would always be morally wrong because you thereby make possible the, um, these bad reactions on the part of the viewers and maybe even on the part of the painter mm -hmm. or, or sculptor or whatever it may be. Uh, I mean, to me, it seems totally wrong. But, but uh, I mean, for one thing, the idea that I could be held responsible for another person's reaction. If I do, if I do nothing wrong to elicit it, that, that I think is totally wrong. So, so I don't know. I may go to the beach and wear my regular bathing suits, and people are so impressed by my. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, believe it or not, <laughs> uh, I mean certainly I do nothing wrong there, right? So, so that I think would be completely, uh, completely false way of looking at it. Um, but there's surely more there about the, the, the difficulty of um, posing as a nude and what makes it um, right. I mean, I think if you know it's going to be used by an artist who has no taste or an artist who, who is likely to portray you as a, uh, you know, in a wrong way, then I think you might, and I certainly wouldn't do it and, and it would be imprudent, but I think maybe even more it would be almost a kind of formal cooperation with, uh, with the production of, of a pornographic work or something, maybe not quite pornographic, but at least tending in that direction. So that would be another thought, uh, but there must be many more thoughts. Well, I mean, also in the case of a nude model, it, it's often an object for study so that you can understand the human form. And in that way, I mean, you think of a doctor and how many people they see in nudity. There are times where it's appropriate. And, yeah. Um, for an object, or you think uh, we we were discussing it once, even statues that are made, like the statue of David, yeah. <laughs> is certainly not a pornographic statue, but it is it is the true human form. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the doctor is in one way a very good analogy, but but, uh, but on the other hand, of course, the doctor it doesn't go beyond the office, uh, yeah. hopefully. So so uh, whereas the work of art is specifically meant for an audience, and uh, therefore. Uh, I mean, the nude knows in one way or another she's going to be looked at. Mm -hmm. And some, I think, some people argue with some some um, plausibility that what makes what makes a big moral difference is the fact that you don't recognize who the person is. Mm -hmm. So what's what's there is the is clearly is let's say the female body, but uh, I don't recognize uh, I don't know uh, Kelly or whomever it may be. Uh, so, so there is not um, that. That somehow makes a difference. You are not so much revealing your own body uh, as that you are um, modeling the feminine body and the aesthetic beauty that's part of it in all sorts of situations. So that would be another way of looking at it. Um, and you have found a passage. Yeah, uh, I, I thought for sure that he talked about it here. And so this is on page one ninety two. He says basically just what you're saying, and not even though just about art expressing the truth of femininity, but art expressing the truth of human love, which is embodied and which is sensual. Right? Yeah. So he'll say here that uh, <coughs> art has a right and a duty for the sake of realism uh, to reproduce the human body and the love of man and woman as they are in reality, to speak the whole truth about them. The human body is an authentic part of the truth about man, just as its sensual and sexual aspects are an authentic part of the truth about human love but it would be wrong to let this part obscure the whole. And this is what often happens in art. 
So he recognizes certainly the danger. Yeah. Um, and, and we see, you know, we see these subtle differences between, you know, one odalesque and another, and what is beautiful and what is perverse. Uh, but so, as, you know, he recognizes the, the danger, but also the responsibility of art in manifesting yeah. truth of human love yeah. for it to be an embodied and not only sensual, but also sensual yeah. love. I, uh, I, if I may ask my own question, um, it's related, I think, to this, in, uh, and related to a question that was asked earlier about the unity between se- se- sexuality and self-giving, and whether or not it's possible to withhold yourself. Uh, that seems to me a, a problem uh, very central to um, art, especially plays and movies. Uh, Actors very friendly. Mean, they certainly kiss all the time, and they do lots of other stuff all the time. And the question is, um, what's the morality of that? Uh, I, and I also think it's a very interesting question for the nature of the person, because this this um, possibility, this capacity that the person has to act, that is to say, to do things, but withdraw himself from it, things that don't represent his own selfhood, uh, is clearly a great. Uh, gift and, and, and um, uh, excellence that a person possesses, and on the other hand, I don't know how to how to deal with that in, in the sexual sphere. I don't know if you have any thoughts on it. Um, but and it's, it's somewhat related, right, to, to your question, where am I? So, you have a right not to answer my questions, but after all, I've, I've answered a lot of yours. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, if you want to be that. <laughs> and then we can also talk about uh, clothing. Um, I don't know if any passages there were striking, uh, particularly the difficulty of um, uh, culture, uh, the relativity of culture, um, whether or not uh, how you dress, uh, and the difference of the function of your dress, and so on, and how all that is related to, to modesty. I just wanted to say back to Christopher's according to the page. I don't think that deals with the problem of the model. I think he deals with the work of art, which True. is, after all, an impersonal object that you look at. Yes. The question of morality is it can you, and that goes very much in line with your question, yeah. uh, how far can you go in movies portray a sexual act? Can a person really be, you know, step outside of shame and be yeah. the focus, let's say, of a whole class of students looking at this model yeah. and not violate yeah. the shame. And that's yeah. the big question. You're right. That is that. Uh, you're right. He was totally besides the point. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just didn't want to say it. Just <laughs> be so nice with the wine. <laughs> uh, no, but but thanks. That is, that is exactly no wine for you, Jules. The difficult. <laughs> And maybe now that because uh, the comparison, one the thing. Question of the calling, I think that's very related in how far you can go in exposing your sexual vows yeah. without violating. Right. I think that the three acting, what you wear, and whether you can be a new model, all of those places are there. Yeah. How far can, can you go in yes. this without? Mm-hmm. And I think there is definitely a limit. Yes, what, one limit, I, I, I think. Uh, I think we just have to make since it hasn't yet come up, but uh, I, I think that uh, going all the way on the screen uh, for a movie, I don't even know if that happens. But yeah, it does happen. Uh, <laughs> see, this is my innocence making it so. Well, um, so that I think definitely goes too far. I mean, it, to my mind, that's simply immoral. But, um, but again, that leaves a lot of room. But it is also a definite uh, distinction between acting and the model, because the model is, it never engages in intercourse with, with, the, uh, with the painter or the sculptor. Yes, excuse me, Paul. I think you were first, but I don't. Um, I was thinking in terms of the new model and um, the Thank you. 
concern about um, your doctor, um, the doctor's reaction to your body. So, but if that is make as long as as your as there's a tasteful aspect of, of the pose, not taking it into an extra level or it taking crossing that line. So it's yeah. Yeah. I agree. That's very important. How you're modeling? What pose are you taking? Uh, and if, I don't think it's all of it. You know, there's also you need to know a little bit about the one who's painting you. And then even regardless of what pose, uh, there still is, I think, a lot of creativity in the artist that he can that he can paint any pose. Uh, however, I mean, so so it's but it's an important, definitely a very important uh, element of the of the problem. Did you want to add something to that? I was when talking about the acting, and I haven't really thought about it before, but in a sense, this is not what people do when they have a job. They're sort of just acting out this. Like, I guess, how would that be different? Because you're sort of engaging in this activity without that emotional reality of the love. Well... I don't think I don't think acting is. Um, I mean, in some ways, of course, they're acting. But you could also say, for one thing, it's it's closer to lying, perhaps. It's also perhaps often a kind of unthinking. But, but perhaps the most important difference, at least, that occurs, you know, is that the actor really, I mean, has a has the intention of <laughs> portraying a role or portraying a truth through his role, and therefore can also act under a sense of vocation. And, uh, and, and so rather than just blowing off steam or seeking some pleasure before you go study, uh, here you have the vocation to, to uh, the artist's vocation to truth, which has its own moral problems. So I can imagine artists, serious artists, Catholic artists, really in a quandary. All right, I'm asked to act this scene. I want to portray the whole truth about the person. I don't want to shy away from sexuality, as the Pope explicitly says they, the artist ought to do. And yet, how do I reconcile this? How do I reconcile this more? How do I reconcile this with my family? I mean, the, the artist might be married. You know, well, so, so. I have another question because I just, maybe this is just completely personal, but I certainly wouldn't want my husband to, to be, be an actor. <laughs> I mean, or a new one. I mean, like, is there something about, like, that gift to your spouse? Yeah, maybe. That maybe. It, it certainly, yeah. of course, the wishes of your spouse uh, are very important and are a moral factor. But, but, I mean, like, but it may be even objective. Yet, that would go back to that question that, like, if you haven't met them yet, yeah. are you not, like, giving away part of that gift? But, like, is, yeah. is there sort of, like, an inappropriate sharing of that gift yeah. in the world? I feel like with, I don't know where I heard it, but you know, one time it was described that for our own morality, um, we're watching a movie and say a scene comes on that's a bit questionable that we shouldn't watch that scene. Now it might have been done in, a, a, in as an art, or you know, the, the director might have thought he was making a work of art. But like we were talking about openness earlier. There's a certain amount of stuff that, whether it's art or not, we it's something we shouldn't discover unless it's us discovering it with our spouse. Um, just as we wouldn't go and tell all the business of our spouse with a friend, we should we really be watching these kind of things on TV and movies? You know, we have art that, 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 and I don't know much about art. I know there's art, there's art that depicts love scenes, or there's art that depicts um, naked people. But is there? But would you call art something that actually shows two people in the act? Like, wouldn't I would consider that going too far? And there's a, there's truth, but then do we have to expose ourselves to that outside of discovering it in its proper place? And if it does go too far, then I would say that if we shouldn't be watching it because it, it exposes us to something that we should only be knowing within our spousal union, then the actor shouldn't be 
creating it because it can't, if we should be watching it, it shouldn't be creating it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Uh, and uh, I, mean, it's, uh, I think it's a valid perspective, a good perspective. I don't know. Again, I, I doubt that it's all there's to be said about it. I mean, clearly, uh, if it is wrong, as I, as I think, that, um, that, 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 that engaging in sexual intercourse, going all the way sexually on the screen, that, that doing that with anyone other than a spouse is, is immoral. Uh, then doing it for the screen is, is obviously also immoral. But, See, uh, I don't think there's, I think most actors when they're making a movie, I don't think they're actually, they make it look to us like they are, but they aren't. Yeah, but so that, 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 that's, that's why I, you know, everybody was laughing, that's why I was wondering, does this actually happen? But then I thought of pornography, and I imagine that it does happen, otherwise yeah. probably. So, so, uh, so I think it does happen, and in that case, it's usually pretty clear pornography. Yeah. And, but often, even of course when, when it's covered in sheets and that sort of thing, it can still be, I think, go way too far and be way too suggestive. And, uh, I, yes. No, I, just, I think I used to kind of work right for that line, and I, I'd always understood it as being something like what reaction is likely to cause in people, and um, so something like that, even if it's you know not technically pornographic, it could still have if, you know people so reaction. And, just an example, like modesty and dress. Um, he brings it up actually at the top of page 192, um, and he says that you know certain types of dress or whatever is appropriate depending on the function or purpose what's going on. Yeah. Um, and the example he uses is odd to me. I guess it, it, it reveals this is sort of old. He says, for example, there's nothing immodest about the use of a bathing costume at a bathing, bathing place, but to wear it in the street or walk, or walk is contrary to the case of modesty. Um, but does that, is that to say that you could wear like the skimpiest? I mean, like I, I think that there's modesty there as well. And there's no other purpose is to go bathing. Um, there's all sorts of modesty on the beach. I mean, so I, and, and I think where you go the line is sort of what. You don't have to communicate with percent for other people, right? Isn't that? That's why that's why I'm just modesty. He doesn't sort of bring that into it. Yeah, I I think yeah. that uh, that. Oh, okay. I'm just, I, guess, I guess in that part there, baby costume maybe back then meant something different than what he's now. I guess. Yeah, I I I, uh, I, I there's a, there's this definite thing of of uh, being an occasion of sin. I, what recently has struck me is that that's so easily abused. In other words, it's so easily abused as uh, putting the guilt for my own moral failing on somebody else who may, you know, I think that that happens much more frequently than, than you might think. So I don't want to place the burden on the person entirely for the sins of others who are looking at him or her. So that's the one thing about the occasion of sin. Uh, and, and I may be too sensitive to it because I've seen it too much lately. Uh, but, but the other um, thing is, of course, the, uh, there is a distinction between what you wear on the beach. And, and, and there, again, it depends on the time and the place. Like in Victorian England, something else would be very appropriate than, than now. So, so I think the, the principle there, what is the principle at work here that he says the principle is pretty clear how to apply it in the concrete? That's the difficulty. He, he enunciates the principle at some page. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I have. Um, it's not exactly the principle, but it's um, something that kind of informs this practicality. Um, should I wait? No, no, no. Go ahead. Um, that what you wrote up on one eighty nine. Um, I thought it was very insightful that he said um, the the reason or, or that when women experience shame and they cover themselves, there's there's a certain indication to men that they should have an emotional shame. And so when, when one experiences a shame, it indicates what the other's shame should also be. So when, when men um, experience a shame that they shouldn't look at women in a certain way, it tells women that they should have a certain shame in how much they're revealing, say, say yeah. on the beach. Um, and, and so there's there's kind of a, a give and take where, where you really have to... Um, sense, um, and, and there should be a generous principle of, of um, you know, dressing in such a way as to lead others on the truth and beauty, not, not concealing sexual mm -hmm. values completely, but, but um, indicating to the other the, the, their worth 
yeah. through the way one, one dresses. Yeah. So I, I, I agree with that. Uh, the, it's, it's just that there's the danger that some men are so hypersensitive, maybe through no fault of their own, that if all they see, I don't know, is the, the arms or something, and they get, they get, they get, they, they, a desire arises in them that's not hell, that's not good, that's that's immoral. Should therefore women make sure it's all covered? Well, you see what I mean. So, so I think it, it's, it, it, and and this is why I, say, I I make the point. I've seen too much of exactly that lately, where it seems to me, objectively speaking, the woman was doing was being perfectly modest, and it was the man that was uh, out of order. And f for, for the man to sort of blame that then on the woman, I think is a kind of, uh, it, it, there's all sorts of things wrong with that. But it is uh, already over uh, 4.30, and you know, I would like to continue, we can't, for all sorts of business reasons.